Welcome to everyone. Uh, tonight is the second lecture of our spring series on the migration and mobility nexus. Um, as you might know already, our keynote speakers will address four possible interplays between migration and mobility. And tonight, Angela Paparusso will address the continuum between migration, which is usually conceived as a long-term and permanent form of movement, and more temporary and fluid forms of movement defined as mobility in the public and academic debate. So Angela Paparusso is a demographer and a researcher at the Institute for Research on Population and Social Policies in Rome. She has conducted extensive research on immigration policies and immigrant integration, and she has published several papers on return migration intentions and subjective well-being among immigrants in Italy and in Europe. And tonight she will draw on these two research strands to, to shed light on the continuum between migration and mobility, but also on the importance of considering immigrants' views on their migration experience. And before giving her the floor, I would like to thank you, to thank uh, Roxane Gerber, Aurélie Pont, Eva Van Belle, Mia Gandenberger, and Eva Fernandez, who have organized this event and they have invited Angela Paparusso. Uh, Angela will be speaking for about 50 minutes, I think. Then Tobias Muller, who is professor at the University of Geneva and director of an individual project here at the NCCR on the Move, will have about 10 minutes to discuss her presentation. And finally, we will open the discussion to the audience on WebEx and on YouTube until 7.45. So, Angela, the virtual floor is yours and I very much look forward to listening to you. You can go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Robin, for this um, introduction, this kind of introduction, and thank you for um, uh, the, the, the invitation. Thank you, NCCR, for uh, inviting me. I'm really honored to, to, to be here, uh, even if uh, virtually, and to um, give this public uh, lecture on my um, research um, uh, topic. Um, in, in particular, my okay, my my published and uh, ongoing uh, research on return migration intentions and immigrant subjective well uh, well being um, uh, offer me the uh, the possibility to um, reflect on the uh, policy implication that uh, these two uh, topics have for migration uh, and uh, immigrant integration policies. Uh, I think that um, combining or trying to uh, try to combine this uh, uh, these uh, these topics uh, means to uh, shed light on the importance of considering immigrants' uh, opinions and and also needs um, uh, about their migration experience and their future uh, migration uh, behaviors. Uh, in particular, and in general, uh, understanding these uh, these uh, this information formation, this, uh, uh, this um, uh, mechanism is important for any effective policy intervention, and especially in the immigrant integration uh, policy, policy field, I think that uh, policies can be improved uh, by asking immigrants uh, their uh, opinion about their stay in, in the country, their uh, intentions to, uh, to move, and also about their expectations and wishes 
for uh, uh, for for the future. Um, okay. okay. Um, so today in this presentation, I will. Uh, Mm, I will uh, present uh, the, the, the results of three uh, papers. Uh, the, the, the first one is on retard migration intentions in Italy, and the uh, other uh, two papers are on immigrants' uh, subjective well being, and in particular on immigrants' self report that life satisfaction in some European countries on the one hand and in Italy specifically uh, in Italy for on the other on the other hand trying to uh, offer uh, some uh, policy uh, considerations for both the, um, the, 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 the papers both the, the topics. Uh, why uh, retard migration and uh, subjective well-being? Uh, retard migration uh, can be uh, considered, can be can be seen as as a part of the entire migration uh, cycle, the entire migration experience. Uh, um, retard migration doesn't uh, mark the, the the end of the of the journey of, of, a, of an immigrant of a migrant, and. Uh, um, it can also take uh, the form of uh, of um, of um, a mythical <laughs> project uh, in in the sense that retard migration can be postponed can, could never happen or can take the the form of a seasonal uh, um, uh, uh, journey to the to the to the country of origin, uh, for instance, uh, Diaz and Fokema talked about a pendular movement between the country of origin and the country of destination. Uh, however, return is uh, uh, a natural uh, uh, desire, a natural uh, wish of any uh, of any, uh, any migrant, and this kind of movement, this kind of uh, um, decision to 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 move to the to to, to come back to the, to the country of origin, can or cannot. Uh, uh, depend on the uh, country of destination of the current uh, country of destination of the of the immigrant and uh, however as uh, country as countries of destination we are interested in uh, asking and uh, answering these uh, research questions do people retard do immigrants intend to 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 return to the country of origin and which are the factors that uh, make uh, immigrants more or less likely to return or to intend to return to the to the home country uh, on the other hand as uh, Diaz has recently uh, pointed out um, in his uh, uh, aspirations capabilities uh, framework uh, he, he, he tried as also other colleagues uh, such as Carling he tried to offer uh, uh, more comprehensive uh, the migration theory um, considering migration as a part of a process of social change for both the country of origin and the country uh, of destination and in general for all the countries involved in the in the in the migration process uh, within this framework he um, distinguish between an, in, an intrinsic dimension, an intrinsic uh, interpretation of migration and migration aspirations, and uh, an instrumental, a functionalist or utilitarian interpretation of, my, of migration. According to the first one, so according to this intrinsic uh, um, understanding of migration, migration, that is the, the freedom to migrate, the ability to migrate, uh, being able to migrate is a well-being enhancing factor per se in, it, in its own in its own right. Even the decision to stay, to 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 not move, to not leave the country of origin is a well-being enhancing factor because uh, the migrant have the 
possibility to think about it, uh, even though, even if it, in, he or she uh, doesn't realize this uh, this movement. Uh, on the contrary, or complementary, if we, uh, we use a, a more functionalist uh, approach uh, to, to migration, to migration aspirations, uh, people, we can say generally that people move to improve their well-being in the new country of residence. Uh, by achieving, for instance, a higher income, a higher socioeconomic status, a better education, uh, also uh, better protection in, in, from persecution in the, in the case of refugees and uh, humanitarian immigrants, uh, and of course also higher life satisfaction and why not happiness. So, for both the, the approaches, the, the, the understandings of migration, we can be interested and maybe we feel also responsible of understanding if people who migrate feel happy or happier <laughs> abroad, uh, if migrants are satisfied with their life, and which are the main individual and contextual uh, factors that make immigrants satisfied or more or less satisfied with their life in the new country of, uh, of residence. Um, focusing, starting to, 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 I will start to focus on, on return migration. And as you, you, yes, you can, you can see, as you uh, may already know, the migration decision making process is receiving a lot of attention. The, the efforts, <laughs> the conceptualization efforts of the US, but also of, of Carling, are uh, reveal these, uh, these. Uh, scientific and political attention uh, to the migration process. And I think, we think that uh, retard migration is, uh, uh, goes in this direction. Migration uh, helps to have a more complete, uh, realistic picture of this migration um, process of this decision making uh, process again to uh, to use these aspirations capabilities framework uh, aspiration aspirations are um, an umbrella uh, term that include also uh, intentions um, specifically uh, intentions uh, reveal uh, realism of migration because aspiration can also uh, be uh, linked to a wish, a desire to migrate, while behind the intention this, there is the idea to realize that uh, the, the movement, uh, the idea of the, of the movement, while of course actual behaviors uh, follow uh, the, uh, the, the migration intentions. However, uh, because of uh, lack uh, of proper, of sufficient uh, data, migration intentions can be and are used as a proxy of uh, actual, uh, actual behaviors. And the studies, a lot of studies have shown that uh, uh, migration aspirations are correlated or can be uh, um, can uh, influence the, the actual movement, the, the actual migration migration flows. Uh, so, using uh, migration aspirations, uh, migration intentions as a proxy of migration behaviors, uh, scholars, researchers um, have tried to understand uh, the factors uh, associated with this uh, uh, this um, uh, this uh, phenomenon uh, has uh, linked to or as um, uh, more connected to an integration transnationalism nexus so the the, the research question is uh, uh, does return depend more on integration or on transnationalism? Or maybe return is the result of both the, the, the processes that interact uh, each other. On the other hand, 
the, the, the decision to move to, to, to leave the country uh, of residence can be seen as the failure of the success of the migration experience. Um, and both the, the frameworks are important and, and used uh, to, to study this, uh, this topic. Uh, this, uh, this topic has many policy implications for both sending and receiving countries, and as I said, to, to, for all the, the countries involved in the, in, the, in the process. If we focus on receiving countries, as I, as I, as I do in this uh, presentation, um, we, we can think uh, return migration intentions as useful for uh, for mobility for migration future scenarios uh, for instance to make an example if immigrants prefer to 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 stay compared to uh, re-emigrate or to to return to the country of origin these have important effects not not only on their life in the in the country of residence so on their status on their rights but also on the policies uh, of the of, of the country so the immigration the integration in general the social economic policies uh, of of the countries that's why i think it's important to inform uh, policy policy makers of this uh, of this uh, process since uh, of course of the factors uh, driving these uh, these uh, processes uh, so uh, within this uh, theoretical uh, framework apparatus uh, uh, Corrado Bonifazzi and, uh, and myself uh, analyzed the individual uh, factors associated uh, with the return migration intentions among first generation immigrants in Italy and we uh, used an Italian uh, survey, social, co social condition and integration of foreign citizens in Italy, uh, carried out by Istant in 2012. And it's nice to, uh, to note that this survey has been uh, recently um, included in a systematic uh, compilation that uh, uh, the EU founded project QuantMIG has, uh, has realized in order to shed light on the importance of intentions and uh, on, uh, of course, aspirations of migration, uh, because this survey has been uh, included in the, in the surveys uh, collecting information on this, uh, in, on this, uh, on this topic with the idea of, uh, of course, inform policymakers and uh, implement or uh, uh, think about uh, future uh, mobility in, uh, in, um, in Europe. Um, as, as you can see, um, most of, uh, of immigrants in Italy intend to, uh, to remain in, in the country, uh, while 27, 28% uh, intend to eventually uh, uh, come back to the to the country um, uh, of origin uh, we uh, in order to investigate uh, um, the, the factors uh, the main individual factors uh, associated with uh, return migration intentions we apply the binary binary logistic regression model where the uh, reference uh, category for the dependent variable was to to stay, to remain, so results are um, displayed, are offered for or refer to the to the country, to the to the intention to to, to return. Uh, we the survey is quite is very rich, so we were able to consider several uh, independent variables that we distinguished among social demographic variables, human capital, immigration variables, and integration and transnationalism variables in order to uh, study or to verify the, uh, uh, the, 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 the already mentioned uh, um, integration 
transnationalism um, nexus in our uh, sample and of course uh, in, in Italy. Uh, results uh, offer uh, interesting uh, um, findings. Uh, um, I would uh, like to, to, to shed light in particular with uh, the, the result uh, for, um, for Philippines and Ukrainians who um, have a higher likelihood of intending to uh, to come back to their uh, country of, uh, of citizenship uh, uh, compared to other nationalities that we considered and uh, compared to other EU and other developed countries. Um, uh, as I, I will uh, I will come back to, to this later but this of course reveal specific migration characteristics of these nationalities in Italy. Also age is interesting because age decreases the likelihood of intending to, to come back and this according to us revealed the the idea of, 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 of a myth of return, according to which the, uh, in, in actually the, the return is postponed at the, at the increase of, the, of, um, of age. Um, according to, the, to a failure a success uh, perspective, immigrants who are independent, unemployed or inactive are less likely to intend to, to come back compared to dependent workers. So, so it seems that they have not achieved their migration goals in, in Italy, so a longer stay is necessary for, for them. Uh, higher education or higher educated immigrants are more likely to um, intend to, to return and this uh, result uh, um, can be uh, linked on the one end to the process of overqualification, which uh, in Italy, among other countries, is a policy relevant uh, issue, but also to the so-called integration paradox, according to which uh, uh, higher educated uh, immigrants uh, can be or can feel less uh, uh, integrated, not in structural terms, of course, but in in the in the under the point of view of of uh, sense of attachment, sense of belonging to to the country of uh, uh, of destination, to the country of residence. Uh, a more recent period of arrival in Italy increase um, life, uh, increase um, return uh, migration um, intentions, while a younger age at, our, at arrival decreases heat. So this result, together with the more family stability in Italy, uh, of course, are linked to the integration process and to the process of stabilization uh, in, uh, in Italy and also of socialization. That uh, is an important uh, predictor of integration and of, of, of course, uh, uh, future uh, movements. Uh, in some extent, uh, subjective well-being, so better feeling in Italy and, better, and having a better perceived health um, decrease the intention to, to leave the country, so they express a process of integration, of satisfaction with their life uh, in, in the country, while having some transnational um, contacts or movements or activities with the country of origin, so more frequent return visits, feeling prouder of being foreigner and watching news of the country of origin, uh, increase the, uh, the, the probability of intending to, uh, to leave Italy, so to return to the country of, uh, of origin. So, uh, 
how these uh, factors, how the, uh, these results can be um, relevant for um, for policy for policy makers. Uh, retard migration and retard migration intentions uh, are shaped both by the immigrant integration process in Italy and also by uh, transnationalism. Um, my question, my research question was, uh, does the EU citizen status uh, um, weaken the uh, centrality, uh, its uh, centrality in explaining retard migration um, intentions? It's not easy to, to answer this, this question because uh, the, the, the specific variable on legal status was not significant, but the results for the other um, nationalities, so for um, uh, the, 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 the immigrants from Philippines and fro, from Ukraine, uh, show uh, that this kind of phenomenon is, depends a lot on the role of the migration project, on the migration pattern. For instance, uh, Philippines and Ukraine, Ukrainians uh, in, uh, in Italy uh, um, have a short-term migration uh, project. They are generally uh, women for runners uh, who, who work in the, in the cleaning and care sector in Italy with transnational families, with families left behind, and they could have a short-term uh, mission in Italy to, to achieve, and so once achieved, they could um, intend to, to come back. Um, are European countries more attractive for immigrants and countries of origin less appealing for return? Of course, our immigrants intend to stay in Italy, but to understand these specific research question, country level factors should be should be cons considered. Uh, however, I think it's important to um, understand that this kind of topic uh, as an important an importance um, relevant um, impact also on uh, not only on migration and integration policies but also on social economic and social policies because of the process of population aging uh, which characterizes Italy as also country of uh, um, uh, immigration and uh, of course the um the the, the already the, the the resources that uh, Italy is uh, um, is um, considering for population aging for fertility decline should be also uh, consider the potential and the uh, current role that immigrants are playing in, in uh, uh, of course, not uh, inverting the process of population aging, but in contributing to respond to population aging and fertility decline. Immigrants are already responding to this, uh, to this, uh, to this process uh, with uh, contributing to the demographic uh, structures of, of the country, to the labor market shortages, especially in uh, dedicated in specific uh, sector. And if they cannot uh, solve or invert the, 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 the tendency, they can, of course, offer an important, uh, an important help. Um, finally, a limitation of this kind of analysis is, of course, the, the problem of selectivity. I'm dealing, we are dealing with um, immigrants who are uh, in Italy, so people who already left is uh, not considered by this, uh, this kind of survey, this kind uh, of analysis. So. Uh, the, the data on countries of origin and on actual movements should be uh, considered and should be integrated in this uh, kind of analysis. 
The second uh, research topic, my second research topic is subjective well-being. And uh, the study, uh, that is the study of immigrant integration from a subjective uh, perspective. Um, the study of subjective well-being is uh, um, part of uh, a broader um, strand of research that, that criticizes objective indicators, especially the, the macroeconomic ones, as unique uh, measures of subject of society, societies, countries. Uh, progress. Um, it doesn't mean that these indicators uh, should not be considered, but subjective well-being should be included among the measures of society's uh, uh, progress uh, development. Uh, I specifically focus on self-reported life satisfaction in my uh, analysis uh, so far um, because uh, self-reported life satisfaction um, refers to a rational analysis, a rational evaluation of people's uh, life compared to happiness, for instance, uh, which conveys, conveys um, an idea of, um, of an, an emotional understanding of people's life, also an effective um, understanding of people's life, life satisfaction um, has to do also with the, the fulfillment of needs, of expectation, of desires. So is uh, more objective in his uh, uh, evaluation of, uh, of well-being. And in particular, it is uh, uh, used to uh, as estimate the, the quality of life within a country or a specific social group. So it's, uh, according to me, uh, perfect to um, investigate uh, immigrants' condition in the country of residence from a subjective perspective and can be used to integrate the analysis of immigrant integration in, uh, in, uh, in, in European countries. Um, as, as said before, uh, this can um, help uh, uh, policymakers and uh, countries of destination to uh, receive the evaluation uh, of, of, of policies by uh, the, 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 the directly by the by the immigrant. Um, According to, uh, to the World Happiness uh, Report of 2018, which was uh, focused specifically on, uh, on immigrants, uh, um, uh, the, the, this, re this report is uh, published every, every year, but this, uh, uh, that one was particularly interesting for, for us, for uh, well-being among immigrants. And, According to their, to their results, uh, generally, so in a typical, in a typical country, uh, immigrants are as happy as people, uh, as natives and people born locally. Um, according to, uh, to them, the, the happiness of immigrants depends on the level, on how accepting uh, locals are towards immigrants. So in a more uh, wel welcoming or accepting country, immigrants are generally happier. Uh, but of course, the happiness of immigrants depend also on pre-migration um, conditions. So on the level of happiness in the immigrants' country of origin. So factors at both origin and destination um, matter in the uh, in the happiness of of immigrants and uh, compared to stayers in the home country so compared to non migrants migrants are generally happier when they migrate to a more developed country but the, the gains in happiness uh, 
are achieved in the first five years after migration. So thinking that a migrant could <laughs> improve his or her happiness in the country of origin for the rest <laughs> of his life is something uh, something wrong. So it's important to consider uh, this, uh, this factor in our uh, analysis. Uh, of course, this uh, results can can change or can uh, differ uh, among uh, countries and among uh, among groups um, but uh, these um, findings uh, uh, reveal that uh, three main uh, approaches um, have been used so far to study immigrant subjective well-being. Uh, the first one is uh, to analyze differences between immigrants and natives. So a possible research question uh, could be, do immigrants become happy as natives in the host country? A second approach is to understand whether migration improves the subjective well-being of people in respect to their situation in the country of origin. So um, we could ask, do immigrants become happier? And finally, uh, a third approach is to explore all the outcomes of migration, so both the positive and the negative ones. And, and this is actually the, the approach I, I follow, I used uh, so, so far uh, in, my, in my works. Um, uh, a challenge, a, methodolo a methodological challenge that I, I faced when I started to, to work on this, uh, on this topic uh, is, uh, um, in particular, I started by using the Immigrant Citizen Survey um, conducted in seven European, in seven European countries. Um, the methodological challenge was to uh, to deal with the uh, by variable of interest. So the way in which uh, life satisfaction in subjective well-being, in particular life satisfaction, was addressed in the in the questionnaire. Uh, in particular. Um, the literature on subjective well-being and quality of life uh, recommends to use the, a single item rating life satisfaction. Life satisfaction has a wall. Um, in this survey, uh, life satisfaction was uh, measured according to separate different uh, um, items. So your life these days, your present level of education, your present job and so on. So I decide to um, reduce these, uh, these dimensions, these items, uh, um, according to uh, through a principal component analysis, uh, in order to have a measure of life satisfaction as, as a whole. Uh, then uh, I uh, use this uh, these, uh, the score, the life satisfaction score, as a dependent variable in a OLS regression that I perform by, by step. Um, so first I introduced the sociodemographic variables, then the human capital variables, and finally the immigration uh, variables. Um, as I expected from the um, from previous studies, uh, age and life satisfaction um, uh, have a um, U-shaped relationship. Uh, this means that the, the, the youngest and the, the oldest uh, immigrants are the most satisfied with their life. Even if recently, um, 
it has been found that this difference or the, the gain in happiness at the youngest and the oldest stages is not very, very high. So uh, differences uh, are small. This kind of pattern exists and is uh, confirmed by, um, by the, empirical, the empirical analysis. Um, in this um, as far as Europe, as far as uh, these uh, European countries, uh, Eastern Europeans and Latin Americans are the most satisfied with their, uh, with their life, while uh, North Africans are the least satisfied. And my reference category, category was, uh, was Asia. Um, of course, or as expected, uh, uh, immigrants uh, who are unemployed or uh, retired are less satisfied with their life compared to immigrants who are working, who are in paid work. And also having a lower financial well-being decreases um, life satisfaction. So and uh, employment and income, a lower, a lower financial well-being uh, can be uh, seen as a proxy of, of income, uh, play uh, an important role in defining people or immigrants uh, satisfaction. Uh, also education is important, higher educational attainment uh, uh, increases uh, self-reported life satisfaction among immigrants in, uh, in Europe and um, those who enter uh, the, the country of residence uh, um, uh, uh, younger are also more uh, satisfied with their life. Uh, as far as uh, some immigration factors I found, or immigration variables, I found that family and long-term immigrants and nationals um, are more uh, satisfied with their life compared to those who have a short-term um, residence in, uh, in Europe and conversely humanitarian immigrants are the least satisfied uh, in, uh, in European countries. Uh, finally, I found that immigrants living in Portugal are the um, most satisfied among the, the, the European, the seven uh, European countries that I, I considered, and the reference category was Belgium. Uh, finally, uh, in, a, in, a, in a paper with Elena Ambrosetti, uh, we um, focus on Italy. So we um, explore life satisfaction and the uh, main uh, associated factors um, with the idea of understanding how um, life satisfaction works uh, in a country like Italy, uh, which uh, belongs to the so-called uh, Southern European model of immigration and integration. Although uh, this model has evolved over time um, and some specific characteristics of the model have also, have also changed, uh, we found that uh, this uh, model, this, this model offers uh, important or still uh, uh, valid uh, interpretative keys of the immigrant integration in Italy, even when a subjective perspective is, uh, uh, is adopted. Mm, we use the, um, the, 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 Italian, um, the Italian survey, of which I, 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 I talked before. Um, here the life satisfaction was uh, classically uh, constructed according to uh, an, a single high time rating life, life satisfaction as a whole, uh, in particular according to the uh, 11 points uh, Likert scale. And we apply the ordinary least square uh, regression model uh, 
because uh, we concluded that according to our uh, to our um, analysis and our studies that uh, assuming uh, ordinality or cardinality between each uh, um, each score each point of the of the scale uh, measuring life satisfaction uh, gave similar results also according to other uh, studies uh, given the richness of the of the survey, uh, we were able to include several uh, variables uh, in order to understand to better understand um, life satisfaction uh, in Italy. So we considered uh, um, social demographic, human capital and immigration variables, but also some uh, uh, transnationalism, a sense of belonging uh, variables that help us to of course, uh, uh, focus more on uh, the process of integration, but also the process of maintaining contacts and activities with the country of, uh, of origin. Um, Besides the, 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 the results on the, the, the demographic, the social demographic um, factors that was more or less uh, expected or in line with, uh, with previous uh, studies, I think it's, it's uh, interesting to uh, focus on some uh, specific aspects here. Uh, in particular, um, results for more recent period of variable in Italy and uh, the EU citizen status. Uh, here uh, we can we can see that a more recent period of variable in Italy uh, decreases life satisfaction. Uh, this uh, result can be, um, we speculate, we can be uh, linked to uh, an increase in policy restrictiveness in, in recent years uh, in Italy, on the one hand, but also from uh, an individual uh, uh, level perspective, uh, also on the less uh, stable, less, less uh, uh, to the more recent process of integration in the country. As far as the EU citizen status, uh, uh, it seems that uh, having uh, the EU citizenship uh, uh, decreases life satisfaction. Um, looking at the, the literature, we found that uh, uh, actually EU uh, citizens may face uh, more um, integration problems, more discriminations, uh, discrimination in, in the country of uh, residence compared to other nationalities. Uh, while the result on the uh, variable measuring the, uh, the fact of, of having benefited of an amnesty in Italy, which is uh, a quite common process, a quite common characteristic uh, of, uh, of immigrants, uh, this variable uh, is uh, positively associated with, uh, with life satisfaction. So, according to the and Southern uh, European model of immigration and integration, um, receiving a residence permit uh, uh, because of thanks to, uh, to an amnesty in Italy is, uh, is uh, something uh, regular, <laughs> is something that uh, happens uh, regularly, at least uh, in the past. So it means uh, uh, um, uh, an achievement in the status mobility of the of the migrant in Italy, and also, of course, a uh, process of stabilization of the of the of the presence uh, in Italy. Um, there are no uh, doubts here that uh, feeling lonely uh, or having weak uh, social networks uh, in, in the country, so no presence of close friends in Italy and also uh, feel uh, discriminated, uh, decrease life satisfaction. While having uh, contacts, transnational contact with the country of origin, has a positive uh, have a positive effect on the, um, the life satisfaction. 
um, in Italy. Uh, so how can these uh, uh, results on these uh, two topics uh, be relevant for policy makers? Um, in, in terms of uh, intervening Meaning on life satisfaction, for instance. So, in terms of uh, trying to improve life satisfaction or subjective well being, um, we have to be aware that uh, there are integration policies for specific groups of immigrants, uh, policies focusing on all immigrants, policies target targeting all individuals and policies for natives only. Um, I think this uh, distinction is, uh, is useful to um, understand that not all the factors associated with lower life satisfaction need specific uh, or uh, immigration integration related actions or interventions. Um, so the factors that can shape or can determine um, uh, life satisfaction are common, are sometimes are common uh, among immigrants and natives. So there is no need of extraordinary policy interventions for, for immigrants. And I think it's relevant for for policymakers in terms of monetary cost of policies, of sustainability of, of policies. Uh, for instance, uh, lonely immigrants or unemployed immigrants uh, um, are lonely or unemployed as natives do, but of course with, uh, with the same socioeconomic uh, conditions. However, I think that welfare policies should include also immigrants. And when I think about the welfare policies or social assistance policies, I um, do not refer only to policies on, uh, um, on paper. Uh, in many European countries, this kind of policies are addressed to immigrants and natives as well. But I also refer to policies on practice, um, so also on the bureaucracy of policies that sometimes uh, affect the immigrant's life, immigrant life satisfaction more than uh, policies uh, on, um, on paper. So sometimes compiling with, uh, with, the, with the details of policies uh, is uh, uh, quite demanding for for immigrants, and this is, and this is an aspect that should be uh, should be should be improved by by policies. Uh, humanitarian immigrants are of course uh, uh, less satisfied or uh, feel uh, mm, less uh, integrated in objective and subjective terms in our um, in our countries and this is a cost also for for us societies to integrate them but of course, of course in the long term they contribute to labor market and demographic issues as economic migrants migrants do and so sometimes immigrants are perceived as a, as a burden as a cost for all societies. This is true, but in the long term, we see, we have seen for Italy, for instance, that immigrants represent a surplus uh, for, uh, for, um, Italian, uh, for Italian policies because of their contribution in terms of taxes, in terms of uh, contributory uh, uh, policies. And, Another relevant um, aspect for both uh, retard migration and subjective well-being is the fact that integration and transnationalism are not uh, conflicting processes. Um, on the contrary, they are compatible. So 
investing in the country of residence does not mean to cut uh, contacts and relationships with the, the country of, of origin. On the contrary, con continuing these, these contacts uh, in terms of monetary and non-monetary uh, contacts, goods in the country of origin, means uh, to increase uh, immigrants' subjective well-being, immigrants' life satisfaction. And uh, results, studies have shown that uh, higher satisfied, <laughs> happier immigrants are more uh, productive for countries of destination. And we should uh, invest in this kind of uh, factors that uh, enable um, people's immigrants to be more uh, satisfied. Uh, finally, I these, uh, these results, both, uh, the, 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 both for, count, for retired migration and for uh, subjective well-being in the country uh, of, uh, of destination, suggest me uh, the, 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 the idea that permanent residence or citizenship rights, so the so-called denizen status, increase um, societal well-being in European countries. Um, how uh, these, uh, uh, these rights can uh, increase subjective well-being? Increase subjective well-being overall subjective well-being, not only immigrant uh, subjective well-being. I think it's not only a matter of equality of rights for all, but it's also uh, a matter of uh, um, participation in major national institutions that increase uh, competitiveness, that increase also the global uh, the global process of all uh, countries and also in respect to other countries as as, as European countries, we should face with the problem of population aging, which, of course, decrease our uh, competitiveness, our progress, and immigrants uh, represent uh, a source in this uh, resource in this uh, in this um, in this sense. Um, just to 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 conclude. Uh, of course, my um, my analysis uh, uh, so far um, um, show the, the 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 issue of uh, reverse causality. So uh, this kind of analysis cannot help us to. Uh, prove uh, reverse causality. For instance, I can make an example. Uh, lonely immigrants um, uh, are can can be um, or, or those or immigrants who have um, less social uh, contacts uh, or networks in the country uh, of the, of destinations. Um, uh, are less satisfied. Ma maybe also immigrants who are less satisfied have some problems in uh, meeting new friends or in having social uh, contacts. Uh, contacts. Um, despite this, uh, this limitation that only uh, longitudinal data can uh, help to, uh, to, to, to solve, I think that uh, these are among the factors or the elements that can be uh, considered, that can be informed policy policy makers, and that can contribute to drive or to start to drive the European agenda on migration and immigrant uh, in uh, integration. I will be very happy to to uh, to have your your opinion, your uh, your point on these uh, uh, conclusions. Thank you, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Angela. That was a nice talk. Uh, I will now invite Tobias Müller to share his slides, I think he has some slides, and to discuss your presentation.
Yes. Seems to be working. Yes. Tobias. Yes. Th thank you, Robin, for inviting me. Can go ahead. Me. And to, to discuss this paper, let me just put this in full screen. Okay, and thank you, Angela, for this uh, stimulating presentation on a very interesting and I think highly relevant topic. Um, and to, to start, I think uh, it is a good idea to ask migrants uh, how they feel and what they intend to do. Uh, but as an economist, of course, this is might seem unusual because traditional economists were rather reluctant to, to use subjective data, data on attitudes and on intentions and well-being. Uh, traditionally, economists rather relied on the idea of revealed preference, uh, so which means that the actual choices of an individual reveal the preferences of this individual. So, for example, an idea, somebody who migrates uh, according to that criterion, must be better off after migration. Otherwise, this person wouldn't have migrated or would return to the country. So that, that's the traditional approach. But then, of course, the rise of behavioral economics has shifted the perspective of economists. And uh, I, I think that now the, the economists have been contributing also to this literature quite a lot. And for example, this World Happiness Report that you mentioned, I think the, the main authors uh, are actually economists originally, Richard Leyer, John Halliwell, uh, Jeffrey Sachs. And um, so in this new, uh, well, it's not, not new anymore, but this era of behavioral economics, um, economists try to explain behavior that was before not seen as rational. Uh, for example, studying social preferences, uh, present bias preferences or project, projection bias. and. Um, many, many different uh, uh, phenomena that, that, that would have been seen as uh, not normal before. Now, um, if I come back to, to my actually my comments on the paper, on the, your presentation, you, you presented three papers that are already published. Uh, so you summarize these papers. So usually I start with a summary. I won't summar summarize your summary of the papers, I think, to start with. And I won't. I don't want to discuss also in detail the papers that are already published. So, so I would like just to pick out really uh, focus on three points here. And some of them, you actually mentioned some of these issues already during your presentation. Um, so first, uh, a few empirical issues um, that, uh, and, and then what to do about it. Uh, so the idea is a little bit perhaps where, where it might be, from my point of view, some areas that where we could go. Um, now, I don't know the uh, literature on subjective well-being as well, of course, as you do, but um, I try to comment a little bit on this. And so I, uh, first I'll talk a little bit about, about empirical issues, then just one specific question, question on, sorry, on subjective well-being. Um, and that's a question that you didn't really address. It was one of the questions that you mentioned, but um, I just want to take this as an example. So whether actually when migrants um, move from their home country to the destination country, does their well-being increase? That, that's one of the questions, of course, that it actually is, well, has a great relevance because some people argue that from the well-being point of view, actually migration is, doesn't really increase well-being so much. And then on return intention, one point that you mentioned, and I think which is quite crucial for in your papers, the idea that future migration intentions are good indicators or use good proxies of future migration behavior. I just want to say something about this. So about the empirical issues first. Um, of course, you mentioned that, uh, that there's a problem of selection, but um, in migration, this is really very pervasive problem uh, because you have selection at uh, different levels or sorting also. So um, first of all, if you take the population in the country of origin, you have um, selection immigrants that are self-selected among this origin country population. So they're not a random sample of that origin country population. So if you want to compare um, migrants in the destination country with uh, those who would be comparable in the origin country, you can't just take the origin country population. It wouldn't make sense. That's not, that's not the relevant comparison group. Then even once the decision has been taken to emigrate, the migrants can still 
choose the destination countries. And I think migrants who go to Italy can be quite different from those who choose to go to the UK or to the US. Uh, so that's, again, you can call that sorting or selection. And finally, and that, that relates rather to, to your point on, on return migration, once in the destination country, there's again a selection process going on that you mentioned also, in, I think, in your, in your presentation, that, of course, migrants might return to their country and, and that changes your sample. So if, if you have a sample of migrants, you, you do not include those who actually were initially there but have decided then to, to return. Um, now, it's very difficult to address all, all these problems, but I think there's, there, there are some more um, issues perhaps with the cross-section surveys that, that you use in your papers. Um, first of all, there, there's this problem that uh, in economics, Borjas had mentioned in 1985, that in, in the literature on, on the integration effects for uh, where, where economists study actually wage, the, the wage profiles of immigrants relative to natives. So if you have a cross-section survey, it's impossible to distinguish cohort effects from integration trajectories. So you, you cannot distinguish actually the effect of the year of arrival and the effect of the year since migration in terms of variables, because the two are perfectly uh, correlated in, in a, a cross-section survey, they cannot be separately identified. Uh, in order to, to do that separately, you need at least two different years, not necessarily a panel, but uh, I think that uh, that's important. So I think one has to be careful when, when about the interpretation of these these variables. Uh, for example, in, in, in the when you study the return intentions, what the or uh, or uh, subjective well-being, what the effect of the year of arrival means it might actually capture some change in, in the cohorts over time. Um, then, obviously, I'm an economist, so I always um, might seem a cheap shot, but you mentioned that, that there's always a problem of endogeneity and reverse causality, that was your conclusion. Um, that's almost unavoidable. I think you, like, some things can be done, and I want to show an example on, on subjective well-being. Um, you mentioned also that longitudinal data would at least help uh, to some extent to um, address these issues. Now, I think well, if you clearly say that this problem is there, I think uh, that's transparent. Um, on the other hand, to interpret your results in terms of policy conclusions and, and policy implications, I think there, there this uh, reverse causality and the endogeneity problem might, might really um, tell you to be perhaps a little bit more cautious. I mean, they have to be, it, it's hard really to know. We don't know whether when we observe a correlation in which direction the causality goes. Um, now, let me just give you an example about subjective well being, where there's one paper that actually addressed uh, kind of all these issues, perhaps not the um, issue of year of arrival, years since migration, but endogeneity and especially selection problems. Uh, and, and that's a paper that exploit that studies uh, migration from the kingdom of Tonga, which is a small island in the Pacific to New Zealand, uh, where they exploit the fact that these migrants um, are uh, selected by an immigration lottery. So first they have to satisfy some criteria, but then there's a lottery and 10% of uh, more or less of the uh, those who would like to migrate to New Zealand are actually accepted in that, in that lottery. And that of course makes up for a perfect experiment, uh, a natural experiment, and um, where you don't have then the selection problem because you can compare those who wanted to migrate with uh, with those who, are, but, but it could not because they, they lost at the lottery with those who actually wanted to migrate and actually migrate. Um, now, what they find is quite interesting. Uh, so, so, and, and I would like to perhaps uh, then draw some con small conclusions from this, but they, they find that the objective well being increased a lot. So, in terms of income and these kind of um, objective indicators, that's perhaps not very surprising. But for subjective well-being, they find really complex results. So, so they find that men, mental health in general improves. And th this is actually a set of indicators. And one of these indicators is happiness. And the happiness is declining. Uh, and that 
Paul Collier, who's a well-known development economist, wrote a book about migration exodus. He actually quoted that result by saying, oh, that might mean that uh, migration has very high psychological costs. Um, but on the other hand, um, other indicators also are, um, are actually improving. So subjective income adequacy, uh, where people are asked whether they think that they, their income is sufficient, etc. This is rising. So, so the conclusion that I draw from this um, is by first, of course, natural experiment, uh, they, they control for selection, but I think we, we cannot reproduce this kind of uh, experiments very often, but some countries that do these lotteries, but uh, it's really a very special context. But as I had mentioned, and you had mentioned, I think going using at least longitudinal data that could go at least in part in that direction. Then the fact that these subjective well-being indicators yield partly almost contradictory results, I think this calls for an approach where when we look at subjective well-being indicators to use actually multiple indicators and not just one. Um, and and I think it's also, and I think you mentioned that in the beginning, that uh, if you look at subjective well-being indicators, that doesn't mean that one shouldn't look at the objective indicators. And I think that's actually important. And perhaps you could even learn more from by explicitly comparing the two and uh, seeing why um, how they are related. And that, of course, has a long tradition also in, in the literature on why, for example, happiness does not increase as much as income. Uh, but I'm not sure whether that has been studied in the context of migration so much, this, this uh, spe specific articulation. Now about the third point, I'm already, I think a bit long here. Let me just be very brief about this uh, now about the migration intentions. Um, here, I'm, I, I just wanted to show you a, a few numbers on, this is from the migration survey that the NCCR on the move carried out and, and our, colleague Philip Wanner uh, wrote a paper on, on the migration intention that I expressed there. And then he looked what actually the migration outcome was two years later. So in 2018, whereas the migration intentions were expressed in 2016. So among those who said in 2016, they wanted to leave, 72% left. Among those who said, said they wanted to stay, 96% stayed. So if you look at these numbers, you could say, okay, fine. That seems, quite good, actually, and good proxy. Now, there, there are actually two problems. One, one is that many, the, the big majority actually answered they did not know. And among those, those actually, the large part stayed. And I think the more important thing is that um, these success ratios, they're asymmetric. And they're only for the first two years. So let me then skip to what I had done with a former PhD student a long time ago, actually, um, in on Germany, where you have a panel, a German socioeconomic panel, uh, where, where migrants are asked every year what their intentions are. So you can follow over time what their intentions are, and then you can also even look at whether they actually return. So if you look at, so the panel started in 1984, and this is, so it's a very different population from the Swiss because this is really the traditional guest workers. Perhaps it's closer to what you have in Italy. I'm, I'm not sure, but, um, and uh, among those who said they wanted to stay permanently in 1984, 74% still were in Germany 20 years later, 26% had returned. But among those who in 1984 had said they wanted to, to return to their country, um, actually six, uh, only 61% have returned and 39% were still in Germany 20 years later. Uh, so that's of course related I think, to your point on the myth of return, but that's not, it's not, uh, so for them, the intention has become a myth. Now, again, these numbers 20 years, that doesn't look too bad, but the implications, if you compute a Markov model, a very simple transition model, which gives some, uses the information, which I don't give here, but on, how many years actually people want to stay and how they revise their intentions. You can see two things. First of all, those who express the uh, desire to go back, they actually postpone their intended return by one year every year almost. And, and, and the implication is that if you, for example, somebody who, who had answered, I want to remain 
two years in Germany in 1984. Now these are the different models, but let's take the last number here. It turns out that this person would actually stay in Germany on average for 23 more years. Uh, so this, and that comes from the asymmetry between, between the fact that more people here, this 39% is bigger than the 26%. Um, and, and it's very systematic in the data. So, so I'm, I take a little bit issue with this idea that the return intentions are a, a very good proxy um, for actual return behavior. And I think it's an important point because this really has policy implications also. Um, because people, because a migrant who, who intends to return in two years will not make the effort to learn German perhaps, or not well enough, make the effort to build a social network in Germany. Uh, and then actually this, this person will finally always postpone the return and they will not, uh, and there will be, might be problems of integration. So th this, I think it's, it's an important point for integration policies. Okay, I've already been, I think, a little bit long, um, but thank you very much for your presentation. And um, yes, I'll stop here. Thank you, Tobias, for these uh, thoughtful uh, comments. I suggest, uh, Angela, you can briefly answer to these comments, as Tobias had quite a few. And afterwards, we will open the floor to other questions and comments. Is it okay for you? Okay. Uh, thank you, Tobias, for your um, um, comments and suggestions. Um, I think that partially i uh, with my with my colleagues uh, respectively with the, the with the, the co-authors of these two uh, of these uh, two um, topics i'm trying to um, to to solve these uh, uh, these issues these uh, these problems in particular uh, as far as um, retard migration intentions and in particular uh, the, the the issue of uh, our migration behaviors good our migration intentions good uh, indicators of migration uh, behaviors um, we are uh, looking at the change of uh, retard migration intentions among uh, immigrants in Italy. Uh, we are trying to compare the, 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 the intention at the arrival in Italy, for instance, with the intention at the, uh, at the moment of the survey, in order to understand if there is a change in this, uh, in this kind of intention. It's not, of course, uh, uh, the same of comparing with actual movements, but it helps, uh, it helps us to have an idea of how stable our migration uh, intentions uh, as far as uh, return or as far as uh, stay uh, in Italy among, uh, among immigrants uh, and trying to understand what are the factors that are associated with the intention or the, the, the stability of their intention or uh, conversely to the, to the change of their migration intention. And this is uh, um, a, a, a work, this is a, a paper. Uh, on the other end, um, about your um, suggestion of using multiple indicator or indicators of subjective well-being and trying to um, compare objective and subjective measures um, we are working uh, on, a, on a focus on second generation um, immigrants in Italy uh, understanding it's, it's of course uh, an example is of course uh, of course an example of this uh, uh, effort of comparing subjective and objective measures of subjective well-being um, of well-being uh, in particular, we are trying to understand um, if uh, um, school outcomes in Italy among uh, uh, immigrant children and native children uh, depends on both uh, objective uh, evaluation of their uh, um, 
of their school outcomes and uh, also on a subjective evaluation how they feel with uh, with uh, with the teacher with the schoolmates uh, with the uh, with the family so mm -hmm. uh, we are uh, trying do we are trying to to go in that direction of integrating objective and subjecting um, measures of course not on uh, first generation immigrants, but on second generation using a, a, a doc survey. Um, and if, uh, again, for the multiple uh, indicator of subjective well-being, uh, we are looking at different domains of subjective well-being. Um, in this case, uh, in um, subjective well-being at school and in the family, in order to have also a, an idea of how subjective well-being uh, change according to some, some domains. That sounds very interesting. I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing that. Okay. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you for um, your answers. Uh, I see that Roxanne has a question for you. So Roxanne, you can just ask your question or do it in, on the chat. Thank you. Thank you for this very interesting presentation and also uh, for this uh, discussion. Uh, I just had a question um, about uh, uh, your results about uh, life satisfaction. I saw also that uh, you had uh, significant differences uh, for men and women. And I was wondering if there is an explanation or... Yeah. Yes. Um, from our, our, um, our data, uh, result that uh, generally uh, females are more satisfied with their life compared to males. Um, this result is not uh, stable, is not uh, um, straightforward in the, in the literature, but uh, with the integration studies, with the integration uh, literature, we interpret the, this, uh, this result uh, um, according to uh, the idea that generally women gain in, uh, in freedom, emancipation, and also in well-being in the country of residence compared to their country of origin, while for males, uh, generally, um, migration uh, means um, a loss of privilege of status in the country of residence compared to the situation in uh, in the country uh, of, of origin. So that's why we think that um, females are more satisfied with their life in the country of uh, uh, of residence. Thank you for Thank your you. question. Thank you for your question and for your reaction, Angela. Um, I, to anybody else has a question. We have about five minutes left. You can ask your, your question if you want. It does not seem to be the case. So uh, I think we had a very nice presentation uh, by uh, Angela Paparusso. Thank you very much uh, for this presentation. I learned a lot personally. And uh, thank you also to um, Tobias, who made very interesting comments to the work of uh, Angela. And uh, I would like now to invite you to uh, follow the the upcoming public lectures uh, also on uh, on YouTube and on on Webex. Uh, the, the whole series, as you know, is about the migration mobility nexus and the next public lecture is about the um, hierarchical relationship between migration and mobility. And it's going to be on the 6th of May with a public lecture by Saskia Bonjour and Sarah Kuhn's uh, discussion together. So I thank you again and I wish you a nice evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.